Boy, good grief, am I right? I forgot what a powerful contraceptive that movie is. <laughs> My man's getting nothing tonight. <laughs> anyway, hi, welcome. Thank you for staying for the panel, and, uh, and thank you for attending this inaugural screening of this wonderful series that Jessica has put together about women-led horror. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest real quick, but, uh, but once more, I'm Andrea Subasati. I'm the executive editor of Rumork Magazine, celebrating 25 years in print this year. Woohoo! Uh, Sarah Ty Black, all the way on the end there, is an arts curator, a film programmer, and critic. You might have seen their bylines for such outlets as the LA Times, the Globe and Mail, and Cinemascope. <laughs> and then right next to me, we have Carolyn Morissette, who is a critic and programmer for the Blood in the Snow Film Festival, as well as the Fantasia Film Festival, and a podcaster, co-host of the Really Melanated podcast, which focuses on black creators and programmers. Applause. So thank you so much for joining me, guys. And, um, and, and the reason I wanted to invite critics and programmers for this panel as opposed to filmmakers is because I feel like the topic of women-led horror cinema is a much wider topic than just the idea of who's making the films. And I know for myself in my career, I have had to defend the reasons why women are allowed to enjoy horror films, why that's not a contradiction, why that's not a weird, I don't know. Um, and not only can women enjoy films, but they can make films and they can make films about a wide variety of topics. So so I, I just kind of want to address the, like the wider discourse around this subject. So let's start there. Let's kick things off with that. I'd like to hear each of your thoughts on how women-led horror is received and discussed in the horror community? Like, what would you say is the current state of affairs of that topic? Oh, you, my dear. <laughs> um, well, I think it's discussed more. Um, and I, I think that there's, the, people are making space for it now. Um, I think it's really important that it needs to be discussed because uh, I, women have uh, a perspective that is really important. And I think a lot of times women and people who identify as women, um, a lot of the times we, we have to live in fear, right? So we deal with horror a lot just in our lives. So I think it's a, a really important perspective to um, open up the space to. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think for everyone generally, horror often functions as this kind of release. Like I am... I'm a fraidy cat, but I love being scared in this kind of controlled environment. And I think when you introduce elements of gender, elements of anything, you know, in terms of your own individual experience, um, it becomes really potent in that way. And I'm glad that we're seeing more and more work um, that focuses on the lives of women, that is made by women. Um, I hope we can kind of get beyond where the mainstream discourse is kind of led to right now, which I think is very white woman centric. It's very cis woman centric. And don't get me wrong, I love those films. But like, you know, there was also like the era of like, like teeth when it was like the the, the female body itself was monstrous, which I love, but it's also very um, like as a non-binary person, it's very uh, like estranging myself for my own estrangement kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see where it goes. I also, we were talking a little bit earlier about like kind of the social dynamics of the horror community and how I like forget that men exist. <laughs> so in my mind, it's like this has always kind of been happening, you know, and it's the same with, with black horror, especially those are the folks that I turn to and I, that's the kind of things that I myself enjoy. So it's, sometimes I forget that that's not the case across the board. <laughs> I mean, that's wonderful. I love to hear that because of course, I, th I think we can remember when that wasn't the case and we can remember how hard it was to make space for these kinds of conversations. And I can remember, I think it was about 12 years ago when uh, Hannah Foreman started Women in Horror Month. She, she kind of declared February Women in Horror Month and there was this big backlash within the horror community where, you know, of course there's the people who are going to be like, well, we observe women in horror all year long, so we don't need that. Like that, yeah, that old chestnut. And, um, 
and and certainly I wonder nowadays I haven't heard any vocal opposition to to programming like this something like this is celebrated so um I guess my question to you guys is like to what extent is that attitude still around I mean using the women in horror month as an example I think that um, as a black femme, as someone sitting beside a wonderful black woman, I think that that example encapsulates like the two kind of feelings that uh, govern the experience of black femmes and black women in horror, where it's like, okay, cool, women in horror month, yes. And then it's like, no, they put it on black history. Month. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's just an oversight. You know, I've Everyone knows February is Black History Month. Um, but then on the other side, there's like the, that pushback, not in terms of that criticism, but in terms of we celebrate women all year. It's like you've, it, it's simply not true, first of all. And it's nice to have uh, a sense of community and event around it because it is something that should be celebrated because it has been um, historically underrepresented for so long, you know, as long as we're not falling into the kind of tokenizing um discourse i don't know if there's any other black folks here but like once january like 20th comes around the, the inbox starts filling up with all these black history month requests i'm not about that but i am about you know finding this common space where we can talk um in our own kind of language without having to explain or without having to feel othered um i think so women in horror month is great um i find like but it it focuses on women characters in horror more so than women directors. And I think that there needs to be a shift for that. Um, and I, I find like on social media, women directors are more vocal now about what they do because there's another thing that women are often, um, I guess, raised to not speak up and to kind of just toe the line and just kind of be, you know, a quiet woman. And I mean, I was raised like that. I was raised not to speak up. So it takes, you have to unlearn that. And I find specifically with women directors, because there's statistics that show that there aren't enough women directors, uh, women of color directors, um, and black women directors, like that's always an uphill climb. So I think that Women in Horror Month is great to focus um, I agree with Sarah, like um, just that th the month might be kind of problematic. However, it also is uh, a moment to shine spotlight on black creators and black horror characters. So, I mean, there is that too. No, I, I, I hear you because I remember when Women in Horror Month came out and everybody was like, yay, Scream Queens, yay, Ripley, yay, Jamie Lee Curtis, and yay, strong female characters, okay. But, you know, there's such there's such a big wide world between movies like that and movies like the one we just saw, which is speaking to, um, I guess, not that specific a context. I guess the idea of being isolated and cooped up with annoying kids is something we know a thing or two about after the last two years. Um, but there are anxieties and fears and experiences that are specific to um, to the feminine experience, to women of color, to queer women. And you know, the more stories we have with these women behind the camera, the more we can experience that. Um, so uh, along those same lines, I remember when I was getting started in horror journalism, I would always be invited to speak about women in horror. I would always be invited to, what's your favorite final girl? What's your, like, I, I was so happy to have earned a seat at the table, but it still kind of felt like the kid's table. And so uh, I want to throw that out to you. Uh, you're both very established in your careers and in furthering these conversations. Do you still have a sense of that, that, that women in horror is kind of a niche special interest group? I don't personally believe it's a niche special interest group, but I feel like the way that women especially and we're sort of getting to the era of like other marginalized gendered folks being tokenized in a similar way. I think that it is a way um, to really conveniently exclude us from more nuanced uh, conversations. You know, it's, uh, I would love if people would invite me to more horror panels. I don't have that problem because everyone sees me as the black film person which is not horror that's another panel uh so i would love it if you want me on a horror panel take me there um but i experienced that in in other contexts um 
but yeah, it is, it is a way of like shoehorning in this kind of um, narrative that things are forward facing, that change is coming, but it, in the way that it's happening, it's not actually doing that at all, you know? And as I was kind of saying earlier, that's why I really am drawn to like these kind of social spaces where we live with that specificity rather than having to um, kind of be on the margins of a presupposed center. Um, that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think there are organizations that um, have always been inclusive and will ask, you know, a broad range of people to talk about horror and be be inclusive. And then there are some that still need work and they feel like now they need to catch up with the other organizations. They're like, hey, do you want to talk about horror? You're a black woman in horror. You, you, you want to talk? <laughs> like, sure. I mean, like I program for two horror film festivals. They're, they're established. Um, and uh, Sure, I'll talk. And, you know, there's, I don't know, I, I can't remember if I was listening to a podcast or there was something on TV. And, you know, a lot, there were, someone was saying that um, basically, even if you're asked to do something and the intention isn't sincere, still do it. And, like, I'll, you know, if you're some dude that doesn't like the fact that I'm programming for two horror film festivals, but, you have to ask me to talk about it and I'll do it, <laughs> you know, like I'll do it. Um, and I think that there is, there's kind of a, a gap that needs to be, you know, filled or kind of abridged so that uh, uh, like as Sarah's saying, like we need to kind of just throw ourselves into the water and, and just dive in and talk about horror wherever we can um, just so that we represent ourselves, I guess. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Take up I would space. like to add like just one thing that I was thinking Please. about while you were talking, Carolyn, mm -hmm. because I think obviously we met because we have similar interests and similar positionings, but you're a lot more embedded in the horror community um, than I am by choice. <laughs> and I salute you for that hard work that you do. Um, but I think also about how like, me and you have never been on a panel together. That's too, too many, you know? It's it's this um, tokenizing actually robs us of our own ability to speak with each other. You know, it, it singles us out as individuals who are just a voice other than sharing our knowledge and sharing our experiences with one another. And I think that can actually be really isolating and sometimes a more insidious function of the type of spaces that are doing these type of things. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Jessica, you're gonna flag me when I'm running out of time, right? Uh, I have more questions for these two, but if you guys have any, feel free to put up your hand and there's one that goes up right away. There's always one. No, I love it. I'm like, you can't see my eyes, but I'm like, who planted you here? I love this. I, I would love to repeat the question, but I am uh, not a neurotypical person. <laughs> no problem. So the first part of your question is actually a question I wanted to ask, so I'm going to come back to that. But the second part was uh, with regard to the Babadook suspension, Specifically, are there any monsters in your basement or that you would like to keep in your basement? Is that paraphrasing correctly? I mean, besides myself, um, a lot of the kind of monsters on screen that I'm interested in are this kind of grotesque feminine. Um, so I really like like the sexy gremlin from Gremlins 2, the new batch. I love things like this where it's like it's it the kernel was like a conventional femininity and it got distorted and distorted through like concentrated adding on. 
Um, I think that's also like as a queer person, we just identify with the villain in horror films for very obvious reasons. So I'm having trouble like pinning it down to just one because I'm very pro monster, pro like ugly thing i feel like that's also like how gay babadook happened we're all like yes same very gender affirming <laughs> yes um none of us were identifying with the mom or the son we're like that's me right there can't help myself um i'm trying to think maybe i'll come back to you with more i just have sexy the sexy lady gremlin i don't know i'll have to look at my body i'm covered in tattoos of th that type of ilk yeah we can get to horror tattoos in a second Carolyn, you got anything? Yeah, I'm just going to kick it old school and say Godzilla because like cranky ass Godzilla though. Like the cranky Godzilla that's like, you woke me up for this? Like I want because I would feed Godzilla snacks and I'd let it sleep. And I don't know. I just, I love Godzilla. So 100% Godzilla. How many times I say Godzilla? <laughs> Five times and he'll show up. Um, we were actually talking in the green room uh, before the film about about what the horror community is and and how we kind of construe the horror community. And so I, I think the monster in my basement is probably Twitter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you take a look every so often and it's like, whoa. And sometimes it's quiet today and I can walk away. And other times it uh, fucks me up. But uh, Oh, you know, Candyman. Ooh. I'm going to heal Candyman's inner child. <laughs> but to piggyback on the second part of your question, I think it's a great question. And I did also want to highlight that, um, that while there are a lot of women making horror movies that address gendered stuff, there's also a lot of women horror filmmakers who are making other stuff too. And I think, you know, it's important that women aren't kind of pigeonholed into speaking about, into feeling like they only can tell stories about motherhood and assault and trauma. So I was actually going to ask you guys if you could spit out a couple of titles, um, a couple of examples of this, both good and bad. What, what was that? Did, did, Shadow of a Doubt? Shadow in the Cloud. I don't know that one. Who made that? Oh. Oh, the, the, the Gremlin film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't seen it, but cool. Great. I'll put it on my list. Well, so wait, it's Midnight Madness when there's only three films in Midnight Madness. Yeah. Yeah. Mine as well have been 2000. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is time? Do you guys have any? Um, a comfort one that I often go back to that I I think is exploring questions of um, how gender becomes practiced socially, but is not explicitly like, this is my feminist film because that's the only film that they'll allow me to make is, is The Invitation. It's weird that it's like a comfort watch for me. Um, I think like that's a really good example of a film that is not just... Because I don't want to watch a film where we focus in on a woman character at the expense of everyone else. You know, I want, the goal here is full breadth for everyone, <laughs> unless we're working in like some kind of like campy kind of form or mode. Um, but I really like that as kind of a study of so many things um, outside of just character, just like horror and suspense. Um, I'll think of more while we continue to chat. Okay. I had to write mine down because I can't remember anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, and I looked and then I forgot when I started talking. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so I, I have two. Okay, so um, one is, a, I believe it's a 2012 film called Helter Skelter by Mika Ninagawa. And it's a Japanese film, kind of, um, it's like a body horror, but not uh, like a body horror adjacent. And it's about this schoolgirl who doesn't think she's attractive and she goes through this whole transformation and becomes this pop star and she's just despicable um it was it's 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 based on a manga and it's like she's just a horrible character but you kind of want to see where she goes and i really that movie has stuck with me for a very long time um and i actually oh my god i think yeah i think my my partner actually tracked it down on DVD. <laughs> I'm like, I must have it. Um, and it's kind of, it's little known. I have to throw out a bit of obscure film 
you know, nerdiness here, but prove yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I really love that film because that character is so um, she's she just has she she changes changes herself to survive, and I I just love that aspect of that character. And um, okay, so I'm gonna try and pronounce her name properly, Lucille Hadzihalovich, and she did Evolution and Earwig. I believe Earwig played um, uh, Tiff as well, and she her vision is so unique and weird, and she's kind of body horror as well. Um, and Earwig, I don't even think I could describe it to you. <laughs> Anybody who's seen it, I can't describe That's it to you. That's how everyone tried to describe yeah. it to me. Yeah. That's why I want to see it. Yeah. yeah, right? And so I love that film, and I would love to get my hands on like a box set of her film, so it happen uh and and sarah ty the invitation you were talking about the karen kusama one about that dinner yes party. okay yes i think one another one came out i just love i think because it's like me disidentifying with it like the, i think there's like maybe there's one black woman in it i think but anyways it's just like what i see when i see white people i'm like <laughs> interesting something is going on here and no one has any clue <laughs> it's like my own like counter reading of its own kind of counter narrative Valid. Any other questions from the audience? Or we can go back to mine. There's one right here in front. Um, so, so I was 100% agree that we need more figure and uh, female voices in movies. I just would like to get a bit more concrete. So if, like, what, what do you think that the same structure is? So if I were to call like my um, local representative and ask for some specific policies, what do you think would, would help to call uh, further that goal? I mean, I'm not uh, a policy. I'm just going to repeat the question oh, real sorry. quick. Uh, the question is, again, like straight out of my notes, is like, what can the movie-loving public, do? there's clearly a lot more work to be done in terms of representation uh, with regard to women in color and queer representation in horror films. So what can the movie-loving public do to help support your efforts in that? Is that fair? Um, maybe not. My answer is maybe not about movie-going public, but just... As a movie watcher, as a critic, I think that um, this kind of scramble for representation has landed us in a bit of a tough spot where there are a lot of stories that don't really have um, integrity or complexity or nuance to them. Um, I'm not alone in being one of the many black critics online who is often talking about how we're in a flop era for black filmmaking, which I think is the that mode of representational cinema that has become the most scrambled at for lack of a better word. Um, but it's, as I said, like it's across the board. Like I remember seeing the trailer for they, them, like as a they, them myself. And I was like, Oh my God, can we not do this? Like it's, I think what I want to see is uh, more queer and trans folks behind and in front of the camera, more black indigenous people color behind in front of the camera, but with integrity, with stories that, maybe don't need to be so legible that don't need to be so translative or pedantic or semantic and like a kind of isn't it great we're doing this and I think that you know I just want more good movies and without having to trade that at the expense of so-called representation I think as a programmer I make it a point of I seek out films that offer representation and I'm I'm very, um, like, I very detailed. I will look and say, will that, will that offend someone? Will that offend someone? Will that offend someone? Like, I'm always, like, making, you know, I have a little checklist. Um, and sometimes, you know, a problematic thing is in a film because it there's a point to be made. So uh, there's that. But for whatever film that I program, if it's by a trans filmmaker, uh, someone who's non-binary, has a non-binary character, I would say for the um, film going, you know, populace to go and see the films, go to the film festivals, support the films, because that's how the underrepresented filmmakers get the buzz going about their films. Um and and seek it seek it out. There's a lot of film festivals out there um, uh, run by women uh, or uh, is part of the like Inside Out, the queer community. Um, just I would say support the film festivals that program these films because otherwise no one's gonna see them. 
you know? Yeah, I think it, a lot of that about being an audience member, I say, like, as a critic and as a programmer, is not waiting for, like, the next big thing. Like, go to, quote-unquote, niche festivals, go to niche screenings, because that's where you're going to find what you want. Like, you don't have to wait for everybody to want to see it. That's mm. not how film has ever been for anyone who isn't, like, a white man or a white woman. <laughs> yeah, it, like, the question wasn't really directed to me, but I, I would also like to add... Uh, uh, to make space and maybe not, you know, intrude upon conversations that aren't about you. Uh, something else that we were talking about in the green room with regard to Twitter. Just think twice before you hit send, before you get into slap fights or re representation about groups to which you don't belong. Can I add to that as Please. well? Yeah, like... Uh, I'm setting I, you up, girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of conversations, like, again, the Women in Horror Month and it occurring during February, there are a lot of people who are getting into the argument that really shouldn't have been in the conversation because it's a conversation for black creators to talk about. So yeah, taking from that, um, and you know, along that lines, if you're unsure about something, like, I guess, even though you want to ask the question, it might not be posited in the right way. So maybe just kind of read and absorb what people are saying, Google I guess. is yeah. free. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Absorb, look it up, but it's, yeah, like, I guess <laughs> that's all I want to say. Love it. Uh, we're good? Okay, more questions from the audience for these two? Sean, oh, were you? Okay, well, this is, this is kind of like, relates to women in horror kind of a roundabout way because uh, I was just curious about Oh, that's actually from the the, 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 the screen five from earlier this year kind of lumped the Babadook into the whole, whole category of elevated horror. So I was wondering, how, what are your thoughts on elevated horror and how it relates to women in film? Okay, I'm just going to repeat that for some reason. Um, he's asking what we think of the term elevated horror and how um, recently in the new Scream movie, uh, Babadook was lumped in there. So how, do, how does... Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't do that because I'm holding a mic, but I'm trying. Air quotes. I hate it. Loser category for losers. Um, I think it just gives people an excuse to watch movies that they would have otherwise been ashamed to watch before. Um, that's very much not my MO. I think as someone who, like, I program everything not at one place but i program in different venues so like if i'm working at like an avant-garde experimental moving image festival there's this expectation that i like i'm not going home at the end of the night to watch all the saws i am and what i'm interested in is kind of um doing away with those hierarchies and i love when the kind of cross mixing happens which is exactly why i hate the category of elevated horror i am distrustful of a 24 despite my <laughs> despite my love of the mo some movies it, there's uh, it, there's a branding being very purposefully manifested that i think um is very elitist and it looks down on people for just enjoying what they enjoy and horror doesn't have to be this thing that proves itself it can just be like some guy's head explodes and you're like oh fuck yes like you know and I I, I just really enjoy all sorts of things and I hate that we have to categorize it or to get some sort of critical attention it needs to be serious because I'm very much not a serious person but sometimes I enjoy serious things so I would bring up, um, okay, so these so-called elevated films like um, Hereditary, for instance, right? So where was Tony Collette's Oscar, right? Because, and and S.C. Davis, like they knocked themselves out in these roles, but like where's their awards? Um, so you, they could say like it's elevated, but they're still gonna like throw, you know, the horror films in the trash. And I love... Every single horror film, like it doesn't matter if it's a B, D, F movie, I love it all. And I just, I agree with Sarah, there shouldn't be a hierarchy. Um, you can't, like, I, I'm so tired of hearing that elevated horror um, phrase because a horror is horror. And it, I, I love watching like some really janky special effects, you know, or like someone's got like a, a puppet, hand puppet monster. I love it. I love it. 
And then sometimes, yeah, I'll, I'll watch like Martyrs or Hereditary. Those are my comfort films. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit of a psycho. That's it. That's it. Martyrs is our comfort film. That's why we met. That's how we met. That's right, right? (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I disagree with elevated horror. So yeah, that's a great question. What's the goat one? The witch. Oh, the witch. The witch. So when it's like the goat, it's a goat, right? The goat is like... Yeah, Wood, yeah. Black Philip was like, Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? I was sitting in the theater and I laughed so fucking hard. And I've never <laughs> received so many bad looks in my life. I'm like, this can't be the point if I'm not allowed to laugh at that. This just can't be why we're here. Well, the last theater was Land. Yeah. Yes. That's lumped into horror, but I've never, I watched it as horror, but it's our Yeah. All right, guys, we're out of time. I would love to talk horror all night long. I want to thank our panelists. And before you clap, wait, wait, wait. What are you guys doing next? Where can these guys find you? Let's continue the conversation. Not on Twitter. Don't find me. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter is where I go to be public. Uh, it's just Sarah Ty. Um, you can find me writing at the Globe and Mail. If you're my mean commenter who's been following me for a year, do not try and find me. Come um, find me. I have like a bit of a shrill thing going on with an M McGinty. If you're here, M McGinty, I don't want to talk to you. Um, or the LA Times. I write actually a lot about horror, but no one wants to acknowledge that. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I well, um, um, Blood in the Snow is happening November the 21st to the 26th. So um, that's the film. I'm one of the programmers for that film festival. So that's coming up. Come out for that. Um, also. Uh, heading the we have a horror lab for underrepresented filmmakers so that is going to be happening during um, Blood in the Snow Uh, yeah so we'll be doing that and you can find me oh my god I'm rarely on Twitter and all I do is retweet and nobody likes my tweets anyway so it's I'm at VFD Pixie Um, and what else am I doing Oh, that's yeah. enough, girl. Yeah, I think you that's definitely it, yeah. can't like go to any horror thing in the city and not see. It's <laughs> very different vibe here. Like you're gonna see her if you want to yeah, see her. I guess. Yeah. Well, when I'm not hugging my cats. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Ty. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Jessica. Read Rue Morgue. Happy Halloween. <laughs>